you've ever had a baby on the way, you may have chosen to get some early prenatal blood tests to screen for genetic abnormalities. A recent investigative piece at the New York Times has highlighted some issues with these tests, and that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Non-invasive prenatal testing is a series of blood tests offered in the first trimester of pregnancy. They were originally used to detect conditions like Down syndrome in trisomy 13 and 18, all of which result from having three copies of a particular chromosome rather than the expected two copies. However, these are screening tests, meaning they don't identify syndromes, they just assess the risk of developing one. If you get a positive result in a screening test, further testing is required to determine if a problem truly exists. Often, the tests required to do that can't be performed until later in the pregnancy, they're expensive, and they carry a small risk of miscarriage. So a high chance of false positives on screening tests can have big implications. Fortunately, these tests can detect trisomies, just like those we just mentioned, with pretty decent accuracy. However, as the New York Times investigation reported, manufacturers have been adding on screenings for additional, rarer conditions in order to be more competitive. Companies market these tests in a way that implies that the results are extremely accurate, which often leaves parents to make decisions based on data that they think provides a near final answer, when it does not. Some percentage of parents who receive a positive test choose to end the pregnancy without confirming or before they get their confirmatory test results back. And it isn't just marketing that's a problem here. In some of the interviews conducted by the Times reporters, patients reported their doctors discussing the results as though they were the final word, with no mention of the difference between screening and diagnostic, and no mention of false positives. And even when they do explain these things, patients often still struggle because the test result sheets so confidently state the odds of the disorder without any caveats. So the thing is, the tests themselves aren't bad, it's the way they're presented that's a problem, particularly for these very rare disorders. One company touts that their test accurately identified 75% of cases of a rare syndrome, with only a 0.5% false positive rate. And that sounds pretty good, and they aren't lying about the numbers, so what's the problem? Emily Oster has provided an example to help clarify what the big deal is. Say you're testing for a syndrome that is so rare that you expect about 20 fetuses in a group of 80,000 to have it. So you test the blood of all 80,000 pregnant people, and you identify 75%, so 15, of those expected 20 cases. That leaves 79,980 people without the disorder, 0.5% of which the test will return a false positive. That's approximately 400 people who are told their baby may have a severe health problem when it is, in fact, healthy. Knowing if your child will have severe health complications is valuable information for making decisions about their quality of life or preparing for the unique needs they'll have once born. In Dr. Oster's example, this information was useful for those 15 parents with an affected fetus. But for the 400 parents given a false positive, the information is detrimental if not presented correctly. There's a big difference between, we've identified this syndrome in your child with a test that is 75% accurate, and, We've identified this syndrome in your child with a test that is fairly accurate, but because this syndrome is so rare, the test is actually wrong more than 80% of the time. Patients deserve better. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this past episode on the 2021 Shkreli Awards, a top 10 list of the worst examples of profiteering and dysfunction in healthcare. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the episode, subscribe to the channel down below, and if you think about going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show even during a global pandemic. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Edward Lillehome, and Brian Nam, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.